Chapter 6 Towns, Traders and Craftspersons Introduction What would a traveller visiting a medieval town expect to find? This would depend on what kind of a town it was. A temple town, an administrative centre, a commercial town or a port town to name just some possibilities. In fact, many towns combined several functions. They were administrative centres, temple towns, as well as centres of commercial activities and craft production. This map shows important centres of trade and artisanal production in Central and South India. Administrative centres You read about the Chola dynasty in Chapter 2. Let's travel in our imagination to Tanjavur, the capital of the Cholas, as it was a thousand years ago. The perennial river Kaveri flows near this beautiful town. One hears the bells of the Raja Rajeshwara temple built by King Raja Raja Chola. The townspeople are all praised for its architect, Kunjara Mallan Raja Raja Parunthachan who had proudly carved his name on the temple wall. Inside is a massive shivling. Besides the temple, there are palaces with mandaps or pavilions. Kings hold court in these mandaps, issuing orders to their subordinates. There are also barracks for the army. The town is bustling with markets selling grain, spices, cloth and jewellery. Water supply for the town comes from wells and tanks. The Salia weavers of Tanjavur and the nearby town of Urayur are busy producing cloth for flags to be used in the temple festival, fine cottons for the king and nobility, and coarse cotton for the masses. Some distance away, at Swami Malai, the sthapatis or sculptors are making exquisite bronze idols and tall ornamental bell metal lamps. Temple Towns and Pilgrimage Centres Tanjavur is also an example of a temple town. Temple towns represent a very important pattern of urbanisation, the process by which cities develop. Temples were often central to the economy and society. Rulers built temples to demonstrate their devotion to various deities. They also endowed temples with grants of land and money to carry out elaborate rituals, feed pilgrims and priests and celebrate festivals. Pilgrims who flocked to the temples also made donations. Temple authorities used their wealth to finance trade and banking. Gradually, a large number of priests, workers, artisans, Traders, etc., settle near the temple to cater to its needs and those of the pilgrims. Thus grew temple towns. Towns emerged around temples such as those of Bhilla Swaman, that is, Bhilsa or Vidisha in Madhya Pradesh, and Somnath in Gujarat. Other important temple towns included Kanchipuram and Madurai in Tamil Nadu and Tirupati in Andhra Pradesh. Pilgrimage centres also slowly developed into townships. Vrindavan in Uttar Pradesh and Tiruvannamalai in Tamil Nadu are examples of two such towns. Ajmer in Rajasthan was the capital of the Chauhan kings in the 12th century and later became the Suba headquarters under the Mughals. It provides an excellent example of religious coexistence. Khwaja Moinuddin Chishti the celebrated Sufi saint who settled there in the 12th century attracted devotees from all creeds. Near Ajmer is a lake, Pushkar, which has attracted pilgrims from ancient times. Bronze is an alloy containing copper and tin. Bell metal contains a greater proportion of tin than other kinds of bronze. This produces a bell-like sound. Chola bronze statues, see chapter 2, were made using the lost wax technique. First, an image was made of wax. This was covered with clay and allowed to dry. 
Next, it was heated and a tiny hole was made in the clay cover. The molten wax was drained out through this hole. Then, molten metal was poured into the clay mould through the hole. Once the metal cooled and solidified, the clay cover was carefully removed and the image was cleaned and polished. A Network of Small Towns From the 8th century onwards, the subcontinent was dotted with several small towns. These probably emerged from large villages. They usually had a mandapika or mandi of later times to which nearby villagers brought their produce to sell. They also had market streets called hatta or heart of later times, lined with shops. Besides, there were streets for different kinds of artisans such as potters, oil pressers, sugar makers, toddy makers, smiths, stone masons, etc. While some traders lived in the town, others travelled from town to town. Many came from far and near to these towns to buy local articles and sell products of distant places like horses, salt, camphor, saffron, betel nut and spices like pepper. Usually a Samanth or in later times a Zamindar built a fortified palace in or near these towns. They levied taxes on traders, artisans and articles of trade and sometimes donated the right to collect these taxes to local temples which had been built by themselves or by rich merchants. These rights were recorded in inscriptions that have survived to this day. Taxes on Markets the following is a summary from a 10th century inscription from Rajasthan which lists the dues that were to be collected by temple authorities. There were taxes in kind on sugar and jaggery, dyes, thread and cotton, on coconuts, salt, areca nuts, butter, sesame oil, on cloth. Besides, there were taxes on traders, on those who sold metal goods, on distillers, on oil, on cattle fodder and on loads of grain. Some of these taxes were collected in kind while others were collected in cash. Traders big and small There were many kinds of traders. These included the Banjaras. Several traders, especially horse traders, formed associations with headmen who negotiated on their behalf with warriors who bought horses. Since traders had to pass through many kingdoms and forests, they usually travelled in caravans and formed guilds to protect their interests. There were several such guilds in South India from the 8th century onwards, the most famous being the Mani Gramam and Nana Desi. These guilds traded extensively both within the peninsula and with Southeast Asia and China. There were also communities like the Chetiars and the Marwari Oswal who went on to become the principal trading groups of the country. Gujarati traders, including the communities of Hindu Banyas and Muslim Bohras, traded extensively with the ports of the Red Sea, Persian Gulf, East Africa, Southeast Asia and China. They sold textiles and spices in these ports and in exchange, brought gold and ivory from Africa and spices, tin, Chinese blue pottery and silver from Southeast Asia and China. The towns on the west coast were home to Arab, Persian, Chinese, Jewish and Syrian Christian traders. Indian spices and cloth sold in the Red Sea ports were purchased by Italian traders and eventually reached European markets fetching very high profits. 
Spices grown in tropical climates like pepper, cinnamon, nutmeg, dried ginger, etc. became an important part of European cooking and cotton cloth was very attractive. This eventually drew European traders to India. We will shortly read about how this changed the face of trading and towns. Kabul With its rugged, mountainous landscape, Kabul, which is present-day Afghanistan, became politically and commercially important from the 16th century onwards. Kabul and Kandahar were linked to the celebrated Silk Route. Besides, trade in horses was primarily carried on through this route. In the 17th century, Jean-Baptiste Tavernier, a diamond merchant, estimated that the horse trade at Kabul amounted to rupees 30,000 annually, which was a huge sum in those days. Camels carried dried fruits, dates, carpets, silks and even fresh fruits from Kabul to the subcontinent and elsewhere. Slaves were also brought here for sale. Crafts in Towns The craftspersons of Bidar were so famed for their inlay work in copper and silver that it came to be called Bidri. The Panchals of Vishwakarma community, consisting of goldsmiths, bronze smiths, blacksmiths, masons and carpenters, were essential to the building of temples. They also played an important role in the construction of palaces, big buildings, tanks and reservoirs. Similarly, weavers such as the Saliyar or Kaikolars emerged as prosperous communities making donations to temples. Some aspects of cloth making like cotton cleaning, spinning and dyeing became specialized and independent crafts. The Changing Fortunes of Towns Some towns like Ahmedabad in Gujarat went on to become major commercial cities. But others like Tanjavur shrank in size and importance over the centuries. Murshidabad in West Bengal on the banks of the Bhagirathi, which rose to prominence as a centre for silks and became the capital of Bengal in 1704, declined in the course of the century as the weavers faced competition from cheap, mill-made cloth from England. Subscribe to my channel. Click on bell icon to get notification about new videos.